Welcome to the Morse Code Podcast, where we talk with entrepreneurially minded creatives in music, film, and writing. My name is Corby, and I'm hoping these conversations inspire you to push deeper into your own work, whether you're a full-time professional or just starting out on your own creative odyssey. I'm really excited to share this conversation with actor and spoken word artist, James Kyson. James has more acting credits than anyone I know, 100 plus roles, including Preacher, Hawaii Five-O, Lovecraft, Country, and more. If you're a fan of that show on NBC Heroes, you might recognize him as the popular role he played as Ando Masahashi. James also played Marcello in our pilot, Morse Code. James is basically curious about everything, curious about life, art and acting, healing and health, spiritual stuff. We talk about all of that and more. My producer Kyle said this was our best episode yet, so okay then. If you get something out of the Morse Code podcast, please like and subscribe. Now here's my conversation with James Kyson. James Kyson, man, it's great to see you. Yes, sir. Nice to be here. Thanks for making time for us. Yeah, nice to see you, man. Um, I mean, we're we're going to talk in uh, your capacity as a a an actor who has booked a lot of projects. I just checked on IMDb, and you have well over a hundred bookings over do I? you do yeah. a lot of student films i bet <laughs> no i looked man i mean let's see some of your your credits include is uh to my recollection you can you can correct me or add to them uh lovecraft country is a recent one yeah um preacher that that's were right. you justified i was it? yeah yeah um, one of my favorite shows actually and um what else? Hero, you're maybe best known for Heroes, a sure. show that ran on NBC for sure. like five seasons. Five or years, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, so <clears throat> I've admired you from a distance ever since. Uh, we, you kind of showed up in the scene sort of at the tail end of the pandemic, the Nashville scene. That's and, right, yeah. And um, I want to get into that. But so l- l- let me set this up a little bit. Like the p- purpose of this podcast is kind of just like to let people in on what it's like to you know do this for a living mm. and both from the perspective of people that are doing it themselves so like hopefully there'll be some working actors that listen to this and aspiring working actors yeah. but also people that are just like what is it even like to be a character actor with a career that's you know in its third decade so i felt like maybe we can talk a little bit about that but yeah first some colorful anecdotes okay um <clears throat> one is like this is this is this is how famous you are and also as you know like how your work just kind of slips through pop culture like you don't even know this you know um but right after we met you randa and i were watching tv um at the end of the day and we were watching we were really into 30 rock at the time i've probably gone through it all the, the seasons now, maybe three times. So we were yeah. just watching it, but it has like, you know, like, like a swoop, a swipe joke. Like, whoosh, you know, yeah. Kind of, yeah. Like, where they kind of fill out the joke. Yeah. And, uh, you were suddenly in, like a cab driver in 30 rock for like three seconds. Then I told you that in your eyes. I remember like the next time we hung out, I told you that dude, you were in 30 rock and you were like, I could see on your face. You were like, was I <laughs> like, like you didn't even remember. I don't even think yeah, you remember I, right I now. I don't think I've ever seen it. So <laughs> I, you know, I, Dude, that was you. That was definitely you. I, I, I don't know. I, I don't know if they've, if, if they used some kind of like a, a footage of us because, you know, um, we're part of NBC. I don't know. I would have to see it to see what the context is. That's crazy. So um, because does that ever happen because you're like an actor on an, an NBC, like on one program within a network, can they and do they, would they take footage from another show and put it well, in? Well, they certainly can because, you know, they, they, they own the rights, NBC Universal. Um, but yeah, I, I mean, I don't think it was me in person because I don't, I don't remember going to 30 Rock and filming a scene, you know? Yeah. Um, but I do remember some kind of uh, weird association where they mentioned something. I remember someone mentioning something that, saying, hey, uh, just FYI, like you guys are going to be on 30 rock and that was it. And I just, I, I didn't really know what that meant. And, um, you know, cause the show shoots in New York and we were filming in LA. Yeah. So, uh, so Hey, I don't know. you're going to yeah. be in 30 rock, but you don't re- remember actually lights, camera actioning. Yeah. Yeah. I think they used, um, probably 
some kind of material that they had so from heroes and they were able to kind of use it in the show in some form yet <laughs> another know? permutation of the working actor's life it's just like you're you're not always even filming the projects that you're a part of yeah it's, well hopefully you're aware of it you know yeah. i mean and this was the whole issue with ai right is that people want um it, it was a matter of consent so obviously with this they had consent because you know they let us know but yeah um but yeah, I, I, w I would like to see it sometime just to kind of <laughs> get the context because uh, yeah, I love that show. Well, let's talk about, um, we, we've worked together and uh, we can get into that maybe, but um, I wanted, I, I just want to talk to you a little bit about like how, how'd you get involved in acting? What, did, was it something you always wanted to do? Did you have some kind of early success like as a kid? When did you sort of start booking? Yeah, I guess I officially started well, the seed was planted in my last year when I was living in Boston. Um, mm. They said, hey, do you want to come do some improv? This was like another fellow student. And How I was old like, were you? Uh, 24. Okay. 23, 24. Um, I had taken some time off and then gone back to school. And I was finishing up. It was going to be my last year there. And I was like, improv, I don't know what that is. And this was before I think like I was even aware of like whose line is it anyway and that kind of stuff. Mm. So... Uh, I went and they were playing a bunch of short form games and I was like, people do this, this exists, this is amazing. So I, I would say that was my introduction to performing arts in a way, which is strange because I grew up in New York City, mm -hmm. um, but I really wasn't part of, I didn't go to the theater. Um, I remember- Were you like, like an athlete kid? What was your crew, who was your crew? Uh, you know, I, I, I think I was just an awkward kid in high school who, uh, was not quite nerdy enough, quite, not quite smart enough to be nerdy, but not quite athletic enough to be a jock. Mm. And so kind of like falling in this like in between place of just like half awkwardness, half like trying to search for an identity um, and was not involved with like the drama club and um, just, just didn't grow up accessing the, the really incredible rich art scene that exist in New York City yeah so it wasn't until like I was leaving Boston where like the seed was kind of planted but then it really started when I came to LA so when you did that improv that you know those the first or second or third experience there it was positive you were like yeah you it was incredibly it. positive okay because I, I didn't know at the time that people had permission to do that I, I didn't yeah. know that form existed totally. and I think I have been so <laughs> deprived of just um, the ability to play and um, and experience games in a theatrical form mm -hmm. that I was like, God, this is so, this is such a novelty mm -hmm. and I want to learn more about it. Uh, when I landed in LA, I took my first acting class at a community college. It was uh, Santa Monica City College and it was the cheapest acting class I could find. I think it was like $60 for the whole summer, you know? That's that's cheap. Yeah. Otherwise people are paying, you know, like, you know, 200 bucks a month, you know, for an acting class. I didn't have that money. So I was like, well, let me just go here. And it was my first official acting class that I ever took. And I remember they assigned the book, uh, a Stanislavski's book. Um, mm -hmm. um, and, and on the act, standard on, book, like the he, standard, the, the old school. Really... Yeah. I just, but I remember reading it and then for whatever reason, it like really made sense quickly. Mm. And I think it's because I grew up, our family moved around so much that if you include, you know, our journey from South Korea to New York City, I ended up going to six or seven different schools in 11 years. So I was constantly wow. like the new kid on the block. So I had to do a lot of like observations on social dynamic and just the characteristics of people. Mm. And I think even as a child, I didn't have language for this yet, but I would subconsciously take on traits of people that I considered alpha or had some sort of social advantage in the environment. Subconsciously or consciously? I, subconsciously. Yeah. Um, because uh, like I said, I didn't, I didn't know the art form of acting or understand psychological behavior. I think I just did that as a sort of a coping mechanism mm. of a child of like, oh, this is kind of how you assimilate or blend in or, you know. So um, so later when I was reading actual text on acting, 
it started making sense. I was like, oh, this is something that I've been doing subconsciously. I've been my whole life. Yeah, in a way. Yeah, sure. You know? Um, and also, I, I grew up in a, a very high conflict family. And so I think mm. I found myself playing uh, sort of the role of the mediator or a peacemaker, sometimes mm. taking on the role of a clown and sometimes taking on the role of um, a griever or, you know, so I think my life journey up until that point kind of placed me in taking on a lot of different roles without even realizing that yeah. that's what those were. Um, <clears throat> how fortunate that you found that that opportunity early enough on that you were like, oh, this is the thing people can do and I can I can use these these skills that I've learned almost by accident by surviving on planet Earth towards something artful and and even professional. Yeah. So cool. And and I do have to credit growing up in New York City. Um, it was not a pretty childhood uh, and a childhood that I would recommend by any means. Mm. But it, because it was such a melting pot of different cultures and there was so much tribalism there. And as soon as you walked out on the street and I, I feel like, I mean, the subways and television were probably my two biggest educators when mm -hmm. I was growing up, you know, it really wasn't at home or at school in the classroom. Mm. So it's really in the streets of New York and all the people that existed in it. And so being coming across so many different cultures and personalities and New York is a kind of place where you're just going to like, people are just, they are who they are and they don't really apologize for it. And there's just such a wide range of energies yeah. and personalities. So I think just having grown, grown up and growing up, observing that, I think it, I was able to kind of like place in my head, like, oh, that type of people, I get it. Oh, those types of people, I get it. Mm -hmm. This type of language, that type of behavior, like something was happening within my own like matrix in my brain that was somehow like cataloging all these ty different types of personalities. Yeah. Uh, and then I think when I was watching in television, I saw those archetypes just kind of like being embodied or represented. You recognize them from the street yeah. on the screen. Yeah. Yeah. And so, and none of this, I, you know, uh, was taught in a classroom. This was all sort of instinctual. And only later on when I had some sort of frame around it as an art form and, and some language, I was like, oh, okay. I now, I, I am able to name the thing that I feel only felt instinctively mm -hmm. for a long time. Amazing. So you had uh, in a positive experience from a creative and artful perspective in Boston. You moved to LA thinking maybe this is something perhaps that I could explore. Yeah, perhaps, you know, it's, I, I mean, I went over there with a one-way ticket and like one suitcase. And so I didn't really have a plan. The classic story. Yeah. <laughs> I know it's a bit of a cliche, but I, I think at the time I really, you know, I didn't, have a lot of options. I knew I wasn't going to go back to New York City because I grew up there. You know what? Yeah. Um, and I, there was a part of me that really needed to, needed distance from my family and just like the familiarity of what I had grown up. And yeah. I also, it just, New York City can really like pressurize you and pound on you to the point where the, the weight just feels unbearable. And I think for me, I, I just really just needed distance from that entire coast. Yeah, for sure. I mean, not everybody had an experience growing up in New York City, but I think that the, the idea of escaping your hometown is pretty common, mm -hmm. especially for creative people that yeah. can feel trapped by their the identities that they grew up with. I know yeah. I totally had that experience. I feel like I had maybe two opportunities to really reinvent myself. One was when I was 18 and left my small town Idaho home for my the college town that I spent just about 10 years in. Uh, in Bellingham, Washington. And then <clears throat> even that was just like, there were so many people that knew me f that whole time. And I had this identity of wh whoever that doesn't matter. And then, but when I moved to Nashville, it's tabula rasa again, you know, and that opportunity to, to mm -hmm. be something new unfettered by people's past conceptions of you is really empowering. I think yeah. for anybody that's looking to try to be more than they have been so i can really relate to your move yeah to absolutely new that, town. yeah that, that really resonates and i think part of my reason for going to la was really okay i need to discover who i am on a blank slate without yeah. anyone's 
preconceived notions or judgments from the past or um and yeah i was a 25 year old and you know i i I didn't have a lot of money i i had no knowledge of the business or no experience you know yeah i didn't i didn't even come from like a small town where i was doing plays and musicals and theater like i i had none of that so literally everything was a blank slate and i was just starting from scratch so okay when i think back like i've when I look at your bio and stuff, I it seems to me that like you had really big press moments um, in I want to say like oh five oh six oh seven or so. You were still very young. You were definitely in your twenties when I'm thinking like high profile, like like some kind of like sexiest man alive roster like checklist. You're in magazines <laughs> and stuff because <clears throat> you are a very fit individual. I will say for our audio listeners. Wow. Um, Trying to get back to it. <laughs> yeah. It's been hard after kids, I tell you that. Yeah. I bet. Yeah, yeah we'll talk about that. Yeah. But um, so did you have some kind of, what I'm getting at is, did you have like a, a I don't know, a meteoric rise to a, a sudden increase in um, opportunity and visibility? Did it happen quick or can you articulate that? Yeah, yeah. My first two years in LA, I was literally um, just doing whatever I can to stay afloat and just take in uh, anything and everything that I can learn. Um, So literally every day felt like a new day Mm -hmm. in a classroom. It was just like so much education. Um, You know, this was days when uh, you would buy Backstage West as as a newspaper form and they would have listing of like, oh, free seminar this and a workshop there. And like, um, you know, so, so, and uh, this was before iPhone, so, we would have a thing called Thomas Guides, which was a book of maps. So I would literally cut these, you know, casting notices out and like I would highlight like my route to like an audition place. And and, and so that's wow. that was kind of like the life, you know? And, yeah. um, but what I had told myself is whatever, you know, cause as an artist, you have all these side hustles, one, two, three, sometimes four different jobs, right? And I already had my share of those when I was working in Boston as a college student. And I said, okay, whatever I do in LA, it needs to be something that that's going to contribute to some kind of performing arts in some form. Like it has to add to my craft in some form. Mm. I can't just side hustle as like, um, you know, waiting tables or even bartending or, you know what I mean? When, when it's not related. So I was like, what are those opportunities? So I started working for educational theater companies where we did shows for kids. Mm-hmm. And that was really like my first time, like being on stage and performing like a, a, a form of a play. It was like, these were like really short skits, like a series of sketches and skits that were geared for student assemblies. Mm-hmm. So like history of Martin Luther King Jr.'s, you know, um, uh, you know, Underground Railroad, the civil rights, where family communications about safe sex and things like that, you know? Mm-hmm. And children are such a great audience because they're immediately interested or not, and they let uh-huh. you know right away. So mm-hmm. you really had to be like energetic and honest. Mm-hmm. Um, so I was doing that. I was an interpreter for Universal Studios because I spoke Korean and they had a lot of international guests come visit from Korea. Um, and even that, I felt like, oh, this is a sort of an, uh, this is like working on improv, you know? And I am kind of public speaking and presenting in some form. So this is kind of honing those crafts in, in, in some way. So, um, but, but back to your question, yeah, it, it was about two years in LA when I went to my first television audition. It was for a show called JAG. Uh, oh, which yeah. NCIS ended up spitting off of. It was a show on CBS about naval lawyers. Jag's dad, or NCIS's dad. Yeah, yeah, dad. yeah, yeah. And um, I, yeah, I, I had never gone to like a television audition before. I didn't even know how these things worked, but a theater company that I was part of, they had sent out, uh, they were sharing a notice from a casting director from CBS to say, hey, we have these, we have this episode that we're trying to cast. And, um, you know, these are two couple of, you know, possible guest stars that we could have on the episode. And so, you know, please share with your network of actors. Mm. And in this episode, um, you, the characters also spoke Korean because there was like a a really interesting episode where like the submarines from two different countries. And I think it was like an American submarine and like a North Korean submarine had collided. And like there were, um, 
you know, they were like in each other's territories and mm. and stuck, you know, like trapped in one submarine and stuff like that. So that was the storyline. So I saw that and I was like, well, I, you know, I could audition for that, you know, like in my naivete. And um, so, yeah, I asked a friend of mine who, you know, had done some really small parts on ER and I was like, how does this work? So he like ended up kind of giving me the love letter. He's like, okay, well, you're going to go to this address and you're going to sign your name in and then you see you know, some other actors in the waiting room and they'll all be kind of like looking at a piece of paper, talking to themselves, you know what I mean? And then you're going to go into a room and, you know, this is who will be there and then they're going to ask you to, you know what I mean? Do your thing and whatever. And then if they like you, they'll bring you back for what's called a callback. So you you said that in your early iterations of going to casting opportunities, you drive around. So this wasn't that. These were different. This was your, this really was like your first like yeah 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 so those first auditions that i was talking about that you know i'll do for i don't know you you know these were everything from student films to you know plays Uh and um you know some kind of like they're shooting like a stock photography and you know you didn't have an agent or anything for this for the jag yeah you know what i did have was um a friend of mine that i my very first play in los angeles um i came out at the very end and set like five lines and then later on, after spending about a year in this play, I ended up playing the main character of the same play. Mm. And one of the girls who was an actress in the play worked at an agency. And she's like, do you have an agent? I was like, no, I don't even know how that works. It's like, what do you want to, do you ever want to come visit and see what an agency does? And this was like a small boutique, like literally like a single owner and some assistants kind of thing. So I went and I like, I guess, quote unquote, interned for like a day or two just to kind of see like, oh, oh, these are headshots. This is what headshots look like. And these are resumes. And um, so anyway, and um, so so she said, hey, I will hip pocket you, <laughs> which means in L.A. terms, it's like, yeah, I'll just, you know, low key. Rep you. Yeah, exactly. You know, so I did have her. So I had her contact info, you know, to put on a resume. So they did call her, you know, when I ended up when I ended up getting the booking. But yeah, so that was basically my start. Um, I ended up being cast for that episode. You, bu- you booked it. Yeah. Congrats. Yeah. So it was my first audition. Yeah. And I ended up booking it. And that had they, you feel. How did that feel? Do you remember? I remember getting the call and um, this person, this agent who was hip pocketing me, they're like, they want to know what your day rate is. Cause it was like a, uh, the character is supposed to be a one day guest star. Yeah. And I was like, I don't know what that is. Yeah. So I didn't, I didn't have a rate. I didn't have anything. And I had to tell her, I was like, Hey, uh, I'm not in, I'm not in the union yet. This is my first job. Yeah. You know, it's like, oh, okay, well then I have to, you know, tell them that, uh, to see if they're willing to tap Harley. They may not, you know, mm. uh, but they did. So CBS ended up tap Harley, which means they basically pay a fine so that you could be in the union. Um, so that gave me my first start. And then I had some serious beginner's luck when I first started because my first five auditions, I ended up booking the first four of them. That's unheard of for it, you guys. So, out there. so, so it was just, it was just kind of luck slash. And I think because I was so inexperienced, uh, that in my naivete, I had a, a sense of a sort of this bravado, like, oh, you just go in and do this. Yeah. Like, there wasn't a lot of like mental Hold baggage. Yeah, yeah. That yeah. came a lot later, you know, <laughs> that started getting more and more increasingly um, yeah, the, overbearing. The, the brooding sense of mortality was, was, wasn't yeah, there yet. Yeah, yeah, um, So yeah, so, um, so that was, that was the start. And I ended up like, you know, um, doing a show on ABC called Threat Matrix, which lasted for a season. And then, um, I got to do some voiceover work for this movie called Big Fish that oh, Ewan dude. McGregor oh, that, was in, that and movie. yeah, and like what, and, what 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 did you do in that film? So um, so there's a thing you know you know what ADR is right? Yes. So ADR just to explain to people that are the yeah so additional dialogue replacement. Um, so sometimes you go on any television show or t- uh, film show, you know, you kind of add all of these sort of like ambiance and background vocals and sounds right and the, you know those could be uh people in a cafe or at an um a newsroom or an uh, fbi bullpen but sometimes they also want you to actually like um replace people's dialogue yeah or or give 
uh, for technical suit. reasons sometimes yeah, or, yeah. or not like it, maybe mm-hmm. maybe the mic the boom mic or the labs didn't pick up the vo- vocal it was too l- loud of an atmosphere or maybe they just the director didn't love the delivery for whatever reason so you could kind of maybe do it slightly differently there's a yeah. couple of different reasons so anyway yes so that was my introduction to voiceover i've never done voiceover work before mm-hmm. and um they wanted to uh i believe in the movie there were some scenes with uh, again koreans in it that needed some korean um dialogue added in so the fact that i was bilingual really helped you mm-hmm. know especially starting out in voiceover so so again, every single time it was like an education, like just being on set for the first time, like I literally had no idea how t- a TV show was made. Mm-hmm. So like, you know, even with Jack and that ended up being like a 20 hour, one hour day, like seeing people carrying cameras and then seeing another person only doing the focus and then seeing another person only carrying like electrical lines and then like someone doing makeup and someone else doing hair. Like I was just like, I was just taking it all in. Yeah. But I was just amazed, like, how many people and how many hours go into, like, filming one scene. So crazy. You know, and you, yeah. I mean, I'm sure it dis- disabused you of the notion um, that may have existed prior was being that uh, <clears throat> it's so glamorous, television production or movie making. It's, it's got this connotation of just being like, whoa. But the reality of it is actually quite the opposite it's very deliberate and slow and tedious and lots of waiting and yeah yeah the hurry up and wait it's yeah but it also what's interesting too like what you described you know there's one guy who's carrying the camera and there's another guy who's like handling the electrical wiring and the division of labor the lines are very rigid people have a job and that is the job that they do right yeah um i mean like i was uh, i did film a commercial and Atlanta yesterday uh-huh. and you know th- it was the second aid the second aid it wasn't the second AD job who is the guy see I don't even know I'm, um the guy <laughs> it was his job to make the talent make sure the talent was you know like where they were needed to be to and from set and uh that yeah, was his usually, whole job usually second ADs were were like a, a base camp PA yeah, that's yeah. right. It was second yeah. AD is right then. Yeah. Um, I was thinking second AC. The right, we don't need to get camera, two. In, yeah, system, we don't yeah. need to get two in the woods with all that. Yeah. But um, anyway, so you you had quite an education and you just paid attention. You kept your your wits about yeah, you. Yeah, yeah. And and, every gig. and um, each and each one of these jobs, I think, kind of, I, I was able to learn something different. I think I think the second job that I ever booked was a sitcom. It was like a multi camera sitcom that Anthony Anderson was doing. Again, I think it only lasted like for one year. I, I've done a lot of like one episodes of shows that only lasted like a year. Yeah. Um, but it was my first time like on a sitcom and then I was able to like learn what a sitcom schedule is. I'm like, oh, okay, you have a table read and the next day you come and you kind of do like a, a run through or we're blocking and the third day you may film some interstitials that they may incorporate into the episode. What's an interstitial? Like, um, like something that they made cut to that you're not doing it live in front of an audience that day, mm. but it might be like a segment of the show that they could kind of like flash to and kind of come back to, which I'm sure they did a lot at 30 Rock, you I'm know? I'm sure, yeah. Uh, but 30 Rock was a single cam, so it wasn't a multi-cam. So, and then, you know, days four and five, you're actually in front of a live audience, almost like staging a play, you know? So that was a huge education. And so I was learning that, oh, wow, like every genre has their own way of working, whether it's a one hour uh, drama where it's a procedural or an episodic or, you know, it's a half hour, a single cam versus multi cam. Mm. And so and all, again, all of this was so new. So uh, this was a really long winded way of kind of, you know, answering your question is that, um, and I was still learning this. Even when I was filming Heroes, I was literally like learning in real time, like, oh, they're doing a wide first and then they're going closer up and then closer in and then they're going to do an extreme close up, you know? And like what that even means for the actor, mm-hmm. you know? Um, what does that mean for the actor now that you know, having done it many times? And- well, yeah, I mean, um, sort of the traditional, very cliche uh, order of you know arranging the shots might be some kind of a wide establishing shot and then getting a little bit closer to a medium shot and then getting a little bit too closer 
to a close up, and then you know if they need to, they may move in even closer to an extreme close up. And we as actors have to be able to adapt to that and know what shot is being filmed, and then serve uh, or your you know your performance to serve you know what they're also establishing with the camera. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean I'm at the beginning of my journey comparatively, but even I've learned a little bit in the last couple of years about the different approach to like a wide versus a close up as an actor. Mm. But I'd love to hear you articulate that for you. What do you do different when the camera's, you know, a two up or a, an establishing shot or the, the wide versus like right, right on you? Yeah. I think again, really everything is so contextual, right? The mm. environment, the storyline, the setting, uh, what are the characters doing? Um, but in general, I think if you're going to communicate something with a choice of physicality, you know, the wider the shot is, the stronger that choice has to be, mm -hmm. right? Because sometimes you could kind of tell a story just even visually. Mm -hmm. um, and then uh, as the camera gets closer and closer, you your parameters of what you can do physically is going to change. Um, so, you know, if they're shooting a close up on us right now, all this movement is only going to not only detract from the performance, but it's not going to work for the camera, mm -hmm. you know, so you um, physically kill like it when the, fr the camera's up that close, you can't do this right where you can in a wide for one thing. Yeah. It's almost like the sandbox that you play in is going to keep changing in size mm -hmm. and, and you have to be within you have to be able to stay within that sandbox. And also your movements read so much larger right. on the closer the camera gets. Yeah. So that's that's something that they don't teach you like in a straight up acting class. That's kind of stuff that comes with experience with camera. And also different set of skills when you're at on a stage, uh, you know, at a theater of 500 people and you have to be, you have to make sure now the people in the back row needs to hear you, mm -hmm. you know? so. Yeah, I think that's what makes acting a very interesting craft for me is, you know, people say acting is acting and that is true. And, you know, where and when and what you're acting in also has a huge influence on, you know, what yeah, we're doing. That combination between doing something maybe mm, intuitive versus technical I feel like those two things are working in tandem at all times. And I'm, you know, hard, far be it for me to speak authoritatively on this, but I'm, maybe that's a question mark. That's how I understand it. Like there's definitely some things that I, when I work, um, that are of, of a technical nature that are from rehearsing and from scene study and from seeing your, myself on camera and being like, Ooh, it's always painful, but, um, adjusting accordingly. And that stuff is, you, you know, even like hitting your mark is a technical part of acting. Um, but that in conjunction with how do I bring this character to life as, as me Corby right now in this room, yeah. those two things I think are always sort of working together. Um, that's how I understand it. But uh, what are you, what's, what's your take on that? Well, I agree with you. And I think these technical aspects, you can really only learn on the job, you know, mm. and also it really depends on the medium. You know, there are people who's worked on Broadway for years, um, but then they've had to learn how to adjust to television. Now, I think adjusting from theater to TV or film is much easier mm. than the other direction. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of times you see like Oscar winners, they go do their first play on Broadway and then just realize, whoa, this is like way harder than, you know, I ever imagined. So, mm. um, but yeah, even, even subtle things like, you know, sometimes you might be, you might be the one that's listening to a, a a character speak and just you shifting your eye line to the other person they're going to use that to then cut to the other person speaking or mm -hmm. listening or you know what i mean mm -hmm. um and then understanding you know where the lighting might be and then whatever your action and props that you know you might be utilizing in the scene and if you're drinking a cup of coffee, we're using a piece of uh, utensil, you know, uh, these things have to match so that the editors 
are able to use whatever you're doing. Yes. You know, and so um, it's really a, it's a team sport that has a lot of individualized specialties. Um, but as an actor, like a director, I think you have to keep all of those things in mind in order to best serve the project. Mm -hmm. um, the, okay, well, I have two thoughts about that. One was when we worked together on Morse code, you played a, a principal character, a really important character, the best friend of the of the main character, Simon, uh, Marcelo. Sure yeah, yeah. And um, I learned a lot from you in that day that we shot watching you um you were very deliberate about the business you had really kind of thought about what you were because there was a scene where you're going to pass me this cup of what i thought was ayahuasca right and the way you had worked it all out and <clears throat> i was also just like super stressed that whole week and barely even there course, in yeah. a certain way yeah as producing it as wearing well many hats yeah um but i i still did catch how much how thoughtful you were in advance um apart from learning the dialogue and everything about the, the blocking what you were going to do like travis the director travis and you, we all kind of worked on the blocking together but within that um specifically with that with that prop i just watched you being really deliberate beforehand like in terms of where it was going to be when you placed your dialogue. And I was like, Oh, and I've noticed that since working with other actors and even in my own stuff and in editing Morse code, the, how important the continuity is that if you have an actor you know, and an actor with some experience, but not much, will think, Oh, I'll give the director options. Um, but really, and you, maybe you should, but keep the options really, subtle it has to be usable options they have to right? be usable options yeah. so if you're like yeah. throwing your hands up in the air on take one and then take three you're here right. well now we can't you can't ever edit you can't use both of those takes right and i was i remember both travis and i pulling our hair out in the edit on morse code on some of the scenes not yours um where the actors were kind of just freewheeling a little bit more yeah yeah um but that's something you don't think about early on, you know, you're, you're, if you're like really in your head about like, who's this Eric, you know, I'm just going to be free. I'm going to embody this character. I got my lines. I'm going to deliver it loud and then quiet. And that's all fine to a point. Right. And, and that might be fine on stage when you're doing a play, uh, because that performance is that performance and it's, 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 it lives for one time and then, and then, you know, you have to do it all over again. Uh, whereas this thing is a living thing that's going to, you know, it has to go, it's like a puzzle piece that has to go with other pieces. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I think that's why, you know, one of the best things an actor can do to sort of improve their craft is to direct, is to write, is to edit, uh, is to, you know, learn how to cast. Because I think when you understand what goes into each of these jobs, you realize this is a huge wheel yeah. And I'm just, and acting is just a one tiny spoke of oh a my wheel. God. I'm so glad you said that. To make the thing that, you know, to make yeah. it go around. And so I think once you understand that, then your performance, the the, the spoke that you are hired to do, you know, it, it, it's, it's, it's done in a way that serves the entire project and all the other departments. Yes, as a like being a team player, yeah. as opposed to thinking that you're the center of the room when you're doing your right, thing. right. Yes, Which both you, you both 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 metaphorically, energetically, <laughs> and also technically. Yeah, you know? yeah. yeah, absolutely. Um, Randa and I talk about that a lot. My wife Randa, um, she, you know, she's an actor, very talented, and also we produced several things together. She produced Morse Code, so we've worked on both sides of the camera, and um, working with different people really quickly, you get. Um, a, a list of people that you'd like to work with again and people maybe you might not take that opportunity and that is everything about their attitude on set and their notion of themselves vis-a-vis -vis the entire operation and the people who serve the project are such a joy to work with because they get it they're not like sitting there waiting <clears throat> for their close-up and well, maybe they are, that's fine too, but it's like, be, be, know, know your role within this, this very complicated mechanism yeah. and 
also support the people around you and supporting the people around you a lot of times from an actor means kind of getting the hell out of the way and maybe not right. commenting on something not speaking if something doesn't need to be spoken about right, yeah. <laughs> because there's just yeah. there's time is so important yes. um, their communication is so critical yeah. even like little chatter on set and stuff can be just really distracting if, if yeah. the director is trying to talk to an actor about a specific moment and yeah. there's just so much going on that um, it really is uh, hugely important that everybody be a team player including the actors yeah in improv we talk about the group mind a lot and i think any successful set um it when people are tuned into that uh it just makes everything go smoother and easier and so i think having a sense of just even being reminded of like what's our vision for the day you know or what's mm -hmm. our goal and just kind of like all right Everybody on the same page? Okay, now let's go, you know, get it done. Mm -hmm. And then at the end of the day, and you know, as you know, some of these days can be long, you know, and, and you know, um, I'm really kind of like acknowledging everyone for like, hey, we, we're, we set out to do a goal today and we accomplished it together by working together. And so like just acknowledging that and celebrating that. I think that is just so, um, it become, becomes less and less common, you know, on... Um, on a, on a professional set, it's just because it's sort of just expected mm -hmm. of it, you know, and which is why I really love um, even the project we did together. It, it was such a po great positive experience because it, it kind of brought things back to, um, you know, just kind of like when, when people get together and say, let's make something together. And so everybody's wearing, you know, a few different hats, but also like supportive and helping out. And, and it was such a collaborative process mm -hmm. in, in every way. And I just feel like that's what makes it satisfying at the end of the day. You know, it's like, oh, this is why I want to do this. That's great to hear. Yeah. I mean, I, we've, Rand and I talked about that a lot afterwards, um, that there was, <laughs> there wasn't a ton of money, but there was a lot of, you know, it was a for the love project. Yeah. Everybody everybody got paid but it was you know it was underpaid and people wanted to be there and when that spirit is there it animates everything yeah and um yeah with, with sometimes you're on a larger gig and maybe it's the paycheck's wonderful or the potential you know visibility of the project is wonderful but sometimes with money comes um dull, dullness <laughs> comes uh also a lot of pressure you know mm -hmm. i think what uh, and I think what a lot of people comment on sometimes too, if they've been working in the industry for a while is sometimes it feels like such a fear driven process. Mm -hmm. Like you got to meet a deadline or, you know, time's ticking and, you know, you're spending, you know, millions of dollars a day. So, you know, and so, uh, so then it becomes very pressurized mm -hmm. and hierarchical and sometimes it seems to kind of take the joy out of the process. Now, I think, it's important to be focused and effective and efficient and uh, collaborative, obviously. Um, but I think people tend to come back to projects that really like, God, that was such a joyful process. Mm -hmm. You know, just, I just really enjoy being there around those people working together, you know. And at the end of the day, like everyone is wants to be part of some sort of community. And I feel like film and television sort of lends itself to that element right mm -hmm. like every film set hopefully becomes a community so almost like summer camp you know because it's, it's finite in its nature so mm -hmm. it could be two weeks it could be two months it could be two years and then when it's over you know you kind of say goodbye and you know yeah <laughs> on to the next and so you really want to and 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 hope to enjoy it while you're in it yeah you hope to and I don't, yeah, oftentimes you can. I'm really curious, uh, as somebody who has been doing this for a really long time, you, how have you balanced the, um, your, your passion for the craft and for the work with the kind of stressful reality of the uncertainty of it, of just going from gig to gig? I mean, sometimes you have a long gig, but a lot of times you don't. Yeah. And I really had to contend with that. I, you know, you were asking me earlier about, you know, right around 06, 07, you know, things. That's when sort of like, I guess I got put on the map in mm -hmm. a way where my career really got started, you know. And 
there was a period of about five years or so where I was working very steadily, you know. Um, I think one of the benefits of being on a show is that you feel like you have a job to return to and there's a sense of security. Of course, any show can get canceled any at any point. Sure. So, you know, it's security up to a point. Uh, but I think with that show, uh, because it was having a place in the zeitgeist, uh, I think people felt at least a, some sort of security saying, okay, this is going to go for at least so, a certain number of seasons. What show are you talking about? Uh, this was Heroes, yeah. right? So when we were filming, and this was, uh, we were filming anywhere from 22 to 25 episodes a season. So it was a long season. People were working sometimes seven, eight, nine months on it, mm -hmm. you know? Um, and then for me, I usually would have a hiatus during the summer and I was able to film some different types of projects. You know, I got to go to Tokyo and for a film and then to Bulgaria for uh, a sci-fi film. So for five years or so, it felt like uh, I almost took it for granted because it felt like the norm, like, mm -hmm. oh, this is just kind of like the work life. And um, it felt like there was always going to something, something was always going to be there. Sure. So it wasn't until probably after that chapter where I kind of went back to sort of the journey of a working actor, you know, tons of auditions, most of them not getting it. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, do one episode here as a guest star, do one episode here, maybe a couple of episodes as recurring. Uh, and, and I realized, wow, like that chapter that I had with heroes and the sense of security, that's actually a pretty rare thing, mm -hmm. you know, of course, there are many actors who either don't need to work again because they were, you know, <laughs> you know, they were on a show for 10, 12 years, uh, or they've gotten so successful in their career where they're not, they don't have to audition, you know, mm -hmm. that they can kind of just pick and choose their projects. Um, but I realized that uh, most, most of us working actors in the union, um, this is kind of like the life and the rhythm. And so, you know, you really have to, it's, it's a very mentally challenging profession, you yeah. know? Probably very similar to a working musician, you know? Yeah, I think that one of the differences, I mean, there's definitely some similarities, the uncertainty for sure, the hu the hustle um, for sure. But one of the differences, this is from you know my perspective and my limited experience, is that the nature of auditions is such that they just kind of barge into your life and need to be attended to within the next 24 hours to 48 hours, yeah. you know, they have to, and so there's this kind of weird, um, undermining of momentum of, of routine in the working actor's life. It's if you're auditioning a lot. Yeah. Um, and even if you're like, if you book something long, that's great. But I mean, maybe you're make book a whole movie and you're working six weeks. Well, that's awesome, but it's still only six weeks out of, yeah, and then, and then year. again, you're starting all over again, you know, onto the next. And sometimes it might be six days, you know. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it might be one day, and then it might know, be one yeah, day. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You book a commercial, like, oh, it sounds amazing. Okay, you work one day. <laughs> now you're back to I the mean, drawing board. You know, this is a, <laughs> this is a dumb example from my my small um, perspective on acting, but like, so I booked this um, commercial yesterday and, that we filmed yesterday in Atlanta. So the audition came maybe Monday of last week. Yeah. Turn in the tape. Tuesday uh, you forget about it because the worst thing to do is ever think about like hope that you get the audition you yeah. just got to move forward with your life so right. then f f Thursday or it was either Thursday or Friday um, cookie called and was just like hey you booked that thing I, I guess I shouldn't we'll have to bleep that out Kyle I'm not probably supposed to say what the company is um, for legal purposes um, <clears throat> so she, uh, <clears throat> cookie called me out of the uh, so it's Thursday that I get a call from my agent. She's yeah. like, Hey, you booked that thing. And, uh, the fittings Monday and they're filming Tuesday. It's in Atlanta. You're working local hire, which is a trend that's happening now. And we don't need to get into that, but it's yeah. annoying. 
um, basically it means that you can work in another city, but the production house isn't going to be responsible for a per diem or putting, paying for a hotel or gas or whatever. You kind of just deal with it. Uh, thankfully I have friends in Atlanta and it's fun opportunity to go see some, see some folks. Yeah. So any, my point is that you go from, you know, in the meantime, I'm, we're trying to do this podcast. I'm writing this other thing. I've got stuff that I'm trying to do and it's wonderful to book. I'm always grateful hundred percent, but it is the nature of, of booking that it just undermines. You're always having to, um, switch your plans up as they get disrupted. Totally. It's, I, I compare to you, you're living a life of a surgeon without Mm. the prestige or the salary. (laughs) So you really every you know, other way. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. I mean, like literally, yeah. If if that pager goes off, like you know, mm-hmm. you're needed and and you have to do it. You know, there's no oh, I'll get to surgery when I can. Like it's yeah, it's you know. Now. And and of course, I'm not comparing what we do as actors to uh, saving lives and you know, or, or, you know what what surgeons do, but the urgency feels very similar. Yeah, uh, because you're given a certain deadline and all of a sudden you just, you can't help but feel the stakes, Mm -hmm. especially when you feel like, oh, this is a show that needs all of your attention for the next 48 hours and it could dictate the next four, five, six years of your life in a way that you don't even know. Yeah. You know, and it's not our job to think about those things, but energetically you can't help but feel well, if this is what I do, I I have to be accountable and responsible. So then I must kind of give it, you know, my all mm-hmm. or whatever I can, you know. And that's that's a very it's not it's not gentle on your system. Yes, you know. And then you throw in if you have children or family or you know you you have a partner that you're living with or um, and you know another other responsibilities that you have to tend to. It, it's it can feel really disruptive, mm-hmm. you know. How how have you managed it? I think I'm still figuring that out. Um, yeah, you know, um, the industry has changed so much that now everyone is taping from home. So I think being able to create, which has its ups and downs, by the way, I think. What What are the good points and bad points about self taping? Well, just, to, just yeah. for the uninitiated, I would like to let people maybe who aren't as familiar with the acting process. Um, a lot of times before you would maybe audition in, in a room in front of the producer and or director, or maybe your callback is in, in person, live and in person with those people. Um, and gradually it sort of moved toward just sending in a self tape. So you have your own little studio and you set, set it up and you have a reader off camera and you do that and you send in the tape and then the pandemic really galvanized that uh, approach. And yeah, completely. Now it's hundred percent, almost a hundred percent, you tapes. know, um, which what the, so the good side about the good side tape. is that you, uh, actually know what is being sent in, right? Cause before mm. what, what you would do is you go to an audition and they will tape you you don't even know what you what you have you no did. idea You're, what no what's being shown yeah because sometimes because every room has its own orientation so some people have the camera right there some people have it way over there and mm-hmm. because you don't have a monitor you're not exactly privy to how to quite adjust yourself yeah. to the environment yeah so you just you know you're expected to just kind of come do your thing and leave and then they do all that um, and you're just hoping that well, hopefully it looks you know, good yeah. or, you know, my performance is okay. Now, now you have some control over that because you know what's being sent. Mm-hmm. The downside is that now everyone's expected to be like, a, 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 every, every audition feels like making a short film. <laughs> yeah. You're setting up a camera. You have to, you have to find the reader. You have to set up the audio, backdrop, whatever. You have to, you know, roll camera, check sound, do your takes. And then, uh, you know, I, and then maybe you might review them, you might not, or you know. But you have to do some editing, obviously, mm-hmm. and labeling, and uploading. So you you become a mini production company, basically, mm-hmm. for every single audition that you tape. Um, I mean, it is what it is. It's 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 just it's not going to go back to what it used to be. Mm-hmm. So uh, I think everyone's now you know have been adjusting to that. And mm-hmm. so I think one of the ways to that I've been trying to create. Um, uh, so process for myself is 
Yes, creating a space and a sort of a routine that could make me feel like I am at my best to do whatever I need to do for that moment. Mm -hmm. uh, that took some time to figure out. In fact, I, my first two years during the pandemic, I was struggling hard. You know, I was um, playing around a lot of different setups. I didn't want to do the iPhone thing. So then I was trying the laptop and then I, was, I tried recording on Zoom. And I was like, no, oh, that's not really that great. Um, you know, I, I was, I was uh, zooming in readers because I couldn't have people in front of me. Mm -hmm. And I realized that, that was really wasn't working for me. Um, and then, you know, so, you know, I, I, even if I'm hiring friends, you know, I, I, I wanted to pay them. So then it started getting expensive and I'm like, this is sure. not sustainable, you know, <clears throat> after spending like $1,200 on just taping auditions. Yeah. I was like, and so, so it, it so I'm, I, I feel like I'm still figuring out my process as well but uh, i've gotten to a point where i know what time of the day when i feel like i could give my best work mm. also having someone in front of me and also having some sort of an, an on-ramp meaning giving us some time to be able to move around in a space um, warm up play around you know create some energy and some sense of chemistry to then kind of bring that to the camera yeah, there absolutely has to be a sense of play, right? Yeah. I mean, you have because that's like to bring it back to the, or the beginning of our conversation. You yeah. know, when you had, went to that first improv class, yes. you're like, "Whoa, yeah. people can do this!" I had the same exact experience when I first went to an acting class. I was just like, "This is so free! Like, yeah. this is permission to be somebody you're not, yeah. and that is fantastic. Yeah. What a, what an awesome opportunity!" And and for me, I noticed that the auditions that I get, there's always, there's always a little moment of just like, all right. Um, okay. Let's do, okay. It's tomorrow. Okay. It's short turnaround. Okay. What did I have? Okay. We got to push that aside and we're going to do this now. And maybe there's a little bit of annoyance with that, you know, the all the judgment. time, yeah. all the time. But yeah. I yeah. notice that every single time when I'm actually in the room taping and I've turned my head on, you know, turn the corner in my brain and I'm like this guy for these pages or this action or whatever, no yeah. matter what, it could be totally ridiculous commercial yeah. or like a cool weighty thing that I'd love to book. Um, there's this, it's like, okay, I'm having fun now. Yes. Like every single time. And yes. I, I think that's what has been, been really important to me of staying like in it and, and served by it is that I actually do love doing it. I think, I think that really is the, that magic ingredient. And it's probably why I had the beginner's luck that I did mm. when I first started, because I didn't really care about, I didn't even know what these jobs look like. So mm -hmm. I was just like, this is fun yeah. to do. And I just went in the room with that. And I think that translated in some form. And then as I learned more and more and got sort of deeper into my acting journey, I, you know, I, I actually started losing that sense of wonder mm. and it became more about like, well, I got to become this character to book this job or, mm. you know, oh, I really want to, um, you know, get on this show. So then I'm going to try to do, you know what I mean? And, and it's just, you just kind of, uh, you lose the very thing that really kind of got you in, you know. You start strategizing craft. about it. You're thinking exactly, of the game, yeah, the yeah, and and, and it. it never works. It always works against you. So yeah. in some ways, I've had to do so much work to kind of unlearn some of those things and really kind of start learning to get out of my own way to get back to that sense of play. And it's so funny because I think this is what happens as humans get older, right? Like. You know, I have two very young children, you know, a two and a half, four and a half year old girls. And, and all they want to do every day is play. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. And they may go here and play with blocks. And then now they want to go here and, uh, and play pretend kitchen and have a tea time. And now they want to, you know, they want me to chase them. And then they want to play hide and seek. This is all they want to do constantly. And they're in that sense of play like all day long. And I feel like as we get older, we just, we almost forget how to do that and we almost have to relearn how to put that sense of play back into our lives and i think as actors i've gone through the same thing mm -hmm. where you know and even with self-taping it, it became such a sort of a neurotic process where you know i would be reviewing my performance and then completely in this judgmental space and trying to control like these micro moments like oh i didn't hit that oh i like that one but at that but then it didn't really follow up with that you know what i mean mm -hmm. and just like just getting back to of like <laughs> 
whatever like for the, like you said for this next 30 minutes let's just have the most amount of fun we can mm-hmm. honoring the writing honoring this character but here are the parameters of the sandbox and let's just go play yes and then whatever comes out of it is what comes out of it yes you know we don't need to try to control it one of the things i really admire about you uh in the short time that we've been friends two or two years maybe three um is that it seems like you seek out not only opportunities in acting for for playing but just in your life you know you're always wanting to go for a run or or but you're also like you'll go to these retreats on the regular man you'll go to denver (laughs) and do a um joe dispenza yeah. Yes. What, what, is, what is that guy? Is it a guy? Joe yeah. Spencer? Yeah. He's a, he's a doctor that is combining a lot of science and spirituality. Yeah. And rewind, I, I love that. Your brain. You uh, of all my friends are one of the most kind of, um, most interested in the in spiritual practices in non-traditional formats is maybe mm. what I would say, you yeah. know, and you're, you're not, you're regularly doing something in, in a new place with new people kind of searching for that intersection between what it means to be alive and, um, and in a community with other people. Um, and I always have liked that about you and felt inspired and also pushed in my own way. Um, partly because I have, you know, like right now I'm living pretty trad. I'm a married guy. I, we go to Catholic church every Sunday <laughs> and I'm into it. You know, I yeah. really, I really am. I didn't grow up in Catholic church, but I did grow up in like a Protestant faith. My yeah. folks are very evangelical. Um, but when I was in my early twenties, I was very interested in Zen Buddhism. I sat regularly with, uh, during college mm. with a, a, in the town, a, a Zen Buddhist group. Um, I've done, you know, like a 10 day Vipassana retreat. And I think about that still, that was 10 years ago. Yeah. And I still think about that all the time. Where did like, you do your Vipassana by the way? Wh- where, where, yeah, when? where, uh, it was in Onalaska, Washington, wa- okay. Washington state. Um, I mean, we can, yeah. you know, that's probably a subject for another time, but yeah, like it was just, uh, the, the non-standard spiritual practices have always been interesting to me and like their value, uh, as an ex exploratory tool for being alive. It's yeah. just to me, like, um, unquestionable, just like go check out something new. And, um, I've never, I guess been like afraid of the dogma or something like that, that maybe some of my friends, more trad friends might be, but like the value of, of breathing of trying to um, develop and maintain concentration yeah. isn't it. That's just, that's a spiritual practice, but it's not a, it's not attached to any one religion. It's just a, an amazing yeah. improver of life. Yeah. And I think as artists, it's not a luxury, it's a necessity, mm. you know, and I think it's really paramount to just our relationship to our craft that we travel, we read, mm-hmm. we talk to different types of point of views have conversations that are um, pondering or questioning in nature Mm -hmm. Um, and again really going back to that sense of curiosity that we all had as young children you know and just being curious about the world Um, you know I remember a teacher saying to me early on like how could you expect to be an interesting actor if you're not living as an interesting human Mm. and i think an interesting human is someone who is interested in just different aspects of humanity Mm -hmm. you know and and so um and that's both exploring you know incredible joys and um also uh, not running away from pain and um you know i i you know explore the ideas what it means to suffer and also what it means to um completely transcend yourself and and so and i I think all of these different disciplines uh like i'm hugely into athletics you know i i love sports i love the idea of sports i think sports and um a production team has a lot of things in common right the collaborative nature of it right and 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 so i try to even the way i approach the craft in terms of uh, discipline, I, I tend to think in sports-like terms, you know, like 
number of at bats, you know, what are my goals, you know, um, the on season, off season, training regimen, you know, that kind mm-hmm. of stuff. Um, but I, I think there's so many different disciplines out in the world that is really symbiotic with artistry, you know. And so I think I think for me, it only helps me to explore, um, to be interested in music, to be interested in painting, to be interested in, um, you know, uh, exploring the outdoors, but also like going deep within, you know. Yeah, I mean, if if great acting is about being alive to the moment and immediately present, yeah. then the pra- any practice that kind of cultivates that sense of of being present, of being awake is the, how I think about it. Um, being awake is an easier way for me because I, I it's like um, being aware of what's around you and like everything is fodder for that. Every human interaction, good, bad, and different. Every, like if somebody annoys me, like there's personalities, you know, like a personality type that kind of will always like just kind of get me like somebody who's a little authoritarian or whatever. Yes. Like, <laughs> what's interesting is that like, what does that tell me about me? You know, like am I in, when I'm in the moment, this is like something that's happened along the way as I've gotten a little bit more aware of myself and my own personal preferences. And those aren't necessarily, you know, capital uh, W the way that it should be. It's just like my, the way I am. Yeah. Um, I've been able to sort of divest my, my opinions about other people, not always in it, but in that moment. So anyway, I'm like when I'm in a moment where I'm like, I'm really annoyed by this person, for instance, I, I'm just like, oh yeah, like, look at that. There you are getting so, you're so annoyed by this guy. What, what, what is that saying about you? What is that about your personality that's so annoyed? Um, I don't know. It's just, it's, it's interesting to be awake to what's going on around you and, and not judgmental in so far as you can. Yeah. And, yeah. Um, and that's like when you, when you're doing an audition and you come ac- across a, a brief and the character is like maybe a villain or something or a terrible person. And it's kind of like, if you go in there and you're judging that character, you can't act that character. You have to be that character. You have to identify with that person and their perspective and their agenda and their desires and goals as they understand them. Yeah. And the more that you can identify and empathize with other people that are not like you, I think the more powerful the tool that you bring to bear on whatever character you're auditioning for. Yeah, and I think that it's that level of awareness that separates the craft of acting versus uh being completely out of touch with reality mm-hmm. lost on the street right mm-hmm. um and so yeah i mean as they say it takes incredible intelligence to be able to play dumb characters really well it takes incredible sense of integrity and like moral consciousness to be able to play these quote unquote, darker characters, yeah. you know? So yeah, you're never in judgment of them because you have to know, you have to be able to access their humanity in some form. Um, but yeah, coming back to what you were saying about that level of awareness, I feel like to me, that's the thing that I've always tried to come back to. And that seems to be the thing that I am working on or wrestling with the most is, uh, because I think often, I can get very like single-minded or get uh, sort of hunkered down into uh, a a focus or a discipline or a uh, a wanting to execute uh, or finish a project or some sort of achievement that that I have to really um, force myself into the practice of of being aware of the entire matrix that's happening, you know, this this and, and realize, oh all of this is a game of certain kind, you know? And so there's me, and then there's the observer that is observing me. And then can I zoom out even more and be like, oh, can I be the observer that is observing the observer, you yeah. know? And and then when, I, and when I'm able to have that level of awareness that can kind of like rise above, then I could say, okay, then I know that I can kind of honor this, whatever it's an audition or a film or a project or anything else that I can give it um, the the right amount of attention, energy uh, that it deserves. Yeah. 
without any sense of、um, sort of attachment or feeling like this is a thing. This is this basically is what defines me, you know,、yeah. and completely attaching my own identity or worth to it. I love that. Well, dude,、uh, I'm so grateful to you for having this time. I, this has been so great, and yeah,、uh, I love you as a friend and a collaborator. And I can't wait to work together again. Yeah, thanks, man. We got to sell Morse code, and then we'll have a whole season. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, and、uh, I mean, it's it's such a great story, and these characters just have so much life in them that I really hope that their stories get to be told in some form. You know. Me too.、Um, and I know that there's so many other stories that are living within you, and so you know I hope to see them, and you know would love to tell some of those stories together. And yeah, I'm just and 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 support that in any form. Well, it's gonna happen. Yeah. Until、right, <laughs> next time. Yeah. Right, peace. Peace. Hey! Thanks for watching. Click the like and subscribe button if you wouldn't mind. You can click over here to watch another complete episode, or click here to watch a playlist of the songs of the Morse Code podcast. You know you want to. You know you want to. You know you want to.